how would you know if you were experiencing an earthquake? Well, besides the obvious, there's this. This is the Raspberry Shake, and you can use it to monitor seismic activity at your home, and you can also contribute to ShakeNet, a global database with nearly 2,000 stations. This thing was designed by a team in Panama, and they wanted to make it so anyone could participate in a global citizen science project, listening to the Earth as it moves. But wait, listening to the Earth? The Earth doesn't talk, does it? Well, prepare for your mind to be blown. The Earth transmits its own kind of sound in waves, just like the ocean. It's way more complex than that, but for now, bear with me. Have you ever seen one of these? It's a seismograph, but technology has come a long way since the days of a giant drum and a mechanical arm scribbling Earth's movements on paper. The Raspberry Shake I have is the most basic model, the 1D. It has one geophone that measures vertical Earth motion, the waves of up and down motion that happen whenever the Earth vibrates. Just like those old seismographs, it records a one-dimensional value on a graph over time. But unlike those old seismographs, that data is stored on the Pi locally and also aggregated online with thousands of other shakes in real time. And this system is helping extend the digital revolution of seismology. But I know next to nothing about seismology, so I thought I'd call up an expert. My name is Bob Herman. I'm a professor emeritus of geophysics at St. Louis University. A and I've been looking at seismograms since 1964. So I think I've seen a few over the years. I actually went to St. Louis University, or SLU as we call it, and took meteorology and oceanography. But I had no idea about the history of earthquake research on campus or the fact that Dr. Herman had already been studying earthquakes decades before I was born. Not only that, the university has operated seismographs on campus since 1909, starting with this Weikert seismograph. We've had instruments here since 1909. The first instrument recorded on smoke paper. Hmm. I don't know what and, that is. Well, you take a piece of paper, you hold it over uh, a the uh, alcohol lamp puts s soot on it. Mm -hmm. You put it on a drum, and then on the drum there's a little stylus. And as the stylus drags, it lifts the soot off, and what you'll then see is a little white stripe on the black background. Mm -hmm. If there's no earthquake, you recycle it by smoking again the next day. If there is an earthquake, they would run this through shellac to permanently bond the soot to the paper. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. He also had some examples of photographic recordings made with seismographs like this one, which used light and a mirror to expose paper and produce permanent records like these from Florissant, Missouri in the 1950s. If they wanted to record different frequencies to get more information about an earthquake, they had to have multiple instruments, so they might have four or more sheets of paper they'd have to look at just to study any single earthquake. And I asked Dr. Herman about how that worked in the 60s and 70s, and he said, Oh yeah, no, I, I started this as an undergraduate at Xavier University in Cincinnati, where my job was to drive 20 miles one way each day to a place, go into a dark room, change the paper, and then prom, come back and process this. So this, you know, it's a photographic record, photographic smelly chemicals, and when doing things with big sheets of paper, it's like doing laundry. And studying historic earthquakes was even more work. I asked him what it was like when he got his doctorate back in 1974, and he said this. Okay, what was my dissertation? I studied 10 earthquakes. And to study one earthquake took at least a month to get the data because I had to write letters to different seismograph stations, have them copy that, when I got the paper records back, we had to convert the squiggles to numbers, and we had a, a digitizer, and that all went on to IBM cards. And then you had to take them over across campus to the computer on campus. So um, you spent a lot of time writing programs, maybe thinking more about the programs, and a lot of time just preparing the data. That sounds like a lot of work when nowadays we're used to just pressing a button and the computer does everything for us. Even without devices like the Raspberry Shake, the digital revolution meant researchers like Dr. Herman can devote more time to studying data and improving outcomes. So yeah, it's, uh, I can do more, I can do it faster, 
but then what I'm interested in doing or what I do is somewhat routine and then you provide all these results and then someone else can then use this to do their research study. So nobody uses those old seismographs. I asked Dr. Herman if I could see the instruments they're using today and he brought me to SLU's Seismic Vault which was set up on a concrete slab on bedrock in 1927 and has been recording data 24 seven for almost a hundred years now. Right now, I just have my raspberry shake sitting on the concrete floor in my basement. But if you wanna isolate just the earth's movement and not have a bunch of background noise, like the vibration from household appliances, you need to put a seismometer as close to bedrock as possible. Heck, you can see exactly when the washer started its spin cycle here, and then whenever the dryer goes on, it creates a constant 30 hertz vibration. So to try to cancel out the effect of road noise, weather patterns, and even humans walking around, SLU set up their vault on bedrock. That brings me to an interesting point, like the one in my basement, I put it on the slab, mm -hmm. but I can watch my washing machine when it turns on and see the, the oscillation as the motor's spinning and stuff. So I, I see all that local noise, this is still seemingly connected uh, somehow. Like, what, what is the special thing about setting it here? Well, one thing is, even though it's dirty down there, if you look down there, this is not connected to the building. Uh -huh. There's a crack down there between the floor of the building and this. Okay. So this is then concrete which is poured onto the hard rock. Okay, so it goes down further wherever yeah, that yeah. bedrock But was. this, yeah. But still, yeah, there will be it will pick up local noise. So at one time I was interested in quantifying the noise. It certainly one could tell around here whether it's a weekday or a weekend by how much traffic is on I-64. You could also talk about how much camp, you know, hey, Sunday mornings on campus, students are not awake, yeah. so it's quiet on campus. So anything that generates noise will be picked up and recorded. Weather fronts coming by will make signals because what weather fronts will do to the building is they will cause the building to tilt. Hmm. <clears throat> and so the horizontals at the long periods will pick that up. And the seismometers are so sensitive that they even had to worry about things like the atmosphere rushing into the room too quickly, so they even have these double doors just to get into the room. And later, when we were back in Dr. Herman's office, he even showed how when we went into the vault, the seismometers picked up that change in pressure. They're really sensitive. On the slab, they had a raspberry shake in the middle, but it was surrounded by a bunch of other seismographs. In addition to the old Weikert that's in storage, they had old analog electromagnetic seismographs nicknamed Big Benioff and Little Benioff. This one here in the round one is called a Baby Benioff because it's smaller than this. Mm -hmm. It also means it's a lot late. I, these have been here since 1960 in They've never really been moved. One reason is just they're very heavy. So the reason they're still here is that this stuff is heavy. Then over next to the Raspberry Shake, there are a couple broadband seismometers by Trillium. Those things cost like 10,000 bucks. The big difference between a $10,000 broadband seismometer and the little geophone in the Shake is you can measure a lot more earthquakes. So these things will uh, have a good response so that we could go down to maybe periods as long as 100 seconds. So this would be good for distant earthquakes or for, for regional earthquakes. Mm -hmm. But they also are sensitive at high frequencies, so they provide the information to locate small earthquakes nearby. High frequencies being still pretty still low. Still high frequencies would be below the frequency that the human ear can yeah. hear. Uh, dogs might hear it, but not us. And you know what? You can actually see the live data from all of SLU's instruments on their Earthquake Center website. Just don't all go at once. I don't know how many concurrent users Wiggles can handle. Wiggles. <laughs> Is that the hey. name of the server? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, or <laughs> Shake or whatever, or Query is a good one. <laughs> Can't stop a programmer from having a little fun naming things. Anyways, that's a bit about Slew's Vault. They had a Raspberry Shake sitting in the middle of all those expensive seismographs. So can the Shake hold its own? Well, for starters, here's a close-up of the hardware you get when you buy the Shake 1D, like I have. It has a Raspberry Pi, the Shake sensor hat, a vertical geophone, that's this round cylinder thing, and a bullseye level to make sure that you place your Shake on a flat surface. And all that comes in this clear acrylic case. 
But you might go on Raspberry Shake's website and wonder, why does this thing start at almost 400 bucks? Well, yeah, if you add up the price of each of the components, and we're generous, saying the Geophone's about 50 bucks, the custom case is 50, the custom hat is 50, and the Pi is... wait, 90 bucks now? Well, even with the insane scalping going on, that doesn't all add up to 400 bucks. So what's the value? Well, it's the software and the global network. If you just want to buy all the parts and build your own little seismograph Pi, that's doable for a lot less. But the Raspberry Shake is more than that. The Shake's hardware has been tested and validated against multi-thousand dollar gear like those Trilliums in Slew's vault. Also, the software that runs on the Shake is maintained, and that costs money. Plus, ShakeNet, the global network of Raspberry Shakes, requires servers and maintenance, and the team behind it hasn't been idle either. In the past few years since they built the first Raspberry Shake, the team is continually making their software better. They even built this mobile app that lets me monitor my Shake anywhere, in real time, and they're continuing to build out their APIs for seismology around the globe. So the 400 bucks isn't just the price for the hardware, it's the price to be part of a global seismic network. And if you're wondering whether it works, well, it does. In fact, using the data from my sensor that's in ShakeNet, Dr. Herman actually pulled up an earthquake that happened right by my house a few weeks ago. That's right, this graph, built using some software Dr. Herman wrote, is the first real earthquake I measured from April 29. These two spikes are the P and S waves, and it's amazing being able to see exactly what 4,000 other St. Louisans felt during that small earthquake. And Dr. Herman has his own raspberry shake on a mantle at his house, and here's the graph from his shake. Dr. Herman's software can also pull data from any raspberry shake in a predefined radius and put them together on a graph like this. And I don't know who owns R474C or RA111, but you can see how the earthquake took a lot longer to get to those two locations, and how the way the earth moves changed based on geography. And heck, while I was writing the script, another earthquake happened in southern Illinois that my shake clearly picked up, though it was a lot quieter relative to the day-to-day -day noises in my house. But who cares about any of this? Can a global network of these things do anything to prevent the loss of life or property because of an earthquake? Well, actually, yes. Individual earthquakes can cause millions or even billions of dollars of damage. And in some areas, like around Oklahoma, where underground wastewater disposal caused a huge increase in human-induced earthquakes, it's important to hold corporations accountable for the environmental impact they have. And earthquake sensor networks can help researchers study the frequency of earthquakes and also quickly estimate what kind of emergency response, if any, is needed. Where the modern estimates or the present-day estimates coming in from Shake Map from the U.S. Geological Survey, there is a very rapid estimate of just how many people could have been killed. So if you got so many people killed, that also means you're going to have so many people homeless. And that information can then be used to marshal global response to a disaster so that you can get in medical teams, you can get in equipment, you can get in you know, everything to sustain life like yeah. water and everything else. So a lot of what we did, you know, this is we're still doing research to learn about the earth, to learn about earthquakes using the earthquake data, but we're also the, uh, you know, contributing to a, a global disaster response. And besides accountability and disaster response, seismologists can help inform new building codes. Then, new buildings in earthquake-prone areas can be built to withstand stronger earthquakes and help reduce the damage and human casualties caused by earthquakes. And there are many other uses for seismic data. At one level, you might have engineers that are interested in just what happens in the upper 30 meters of the Earth. So that has to do with the hard rock ground motion coming up to the surface. It's modified by the soils. You build on top of the soils, build your building strong. Okay. Another level of seismology is you're trying to find something underground. And so you might want to look down maybe four or five kilometers. That would be the exploration industry for oil and natural gas. Mm -hmm. Another part of seismology might be interested in earthquake studies. Uh, another part might be interested in volcanoes. And then, of course, there's a whole group that's interested in underground nuclear explosions. In this country, the U.S. Geological Survey worries about uh, um, earthquakes. Uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency worries about tsunamis. 
which also generates seismic waves. And then the Air Force Technical Applications Center is worried about underground nuclear explosions. And that last part, the AFTAC, operates the U.S. Atomic Energy Detection System. They use seismograph networks to detect large-scale explosions and help enforce things like the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So a simple little sensor like this one, when it's part of a global network, can contribute useful data to geophysicists around the world and be used to preserve human life. We can't predict earthquakes and probably never will be able to, but having so much more data and making it easier to access means researchers like Dr. Herman and the new students he's taught over the years can make the aftermath much better. You can find out more about the Raspberry Shake and all the different models they have available at raspberryshake.com. Huge thanks to them for sending this, and to Dr. Bob Herman and SLU for teaching me about seismology and showing me their seismic vault. And until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling. Well, besides the obvious, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. You're smiling. Okay, one more time. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>